Today we continue in our study of the book of Titus. The book of Titus is this beautiful little three-chapter book that is, it's as if it could have been written yesterday for those of us here in South Florida, for those of us here in America, and really anywhere in the world in 2018. I want us to review for just a moment and uh, remind you where we've been. Um, Before I left on vacation, I preached a few weeks ago on the passage that deals with the transformational gospel, and all of these are transformational gospels. It's what we read at the beginning of the service, God's grace in our lives. And the first section that Paul addresses is to older men. And then the second one that Mike Todd preached that I listened to while I was on vacation, and I was so blessed by the wisdom that Mike shared as he preached through older and younger women. Um, and I, he, he accused me of saying, you went out of town so that I would have to preach that and not you, but that's not true. I would have loved to preach that because I believe in the concepts that Mike preached and uh, the beauty of how God has designed this beautiful complementary role between male and female and how our roles are different but the beauty of the gospel is the same for us. And then there was the message that Pastor Ben preached last week, very powerful message for young men. Not only for young men, but for all of us that are seeking to encourage the young men that are around us. And uh, so we have the proper expectation of those who are Christians. Well, today we see that when we're dealing with the congregation and when Paul is writing to Titus saying, hey, this is what you've got to teach and this is what you have to to form in the life of the church, the leaders of the church are not left out in these issues of behavior. Um, We've already looked at that a little bit, but we are going to look at it a little bit more. Look at the context in the background. I want us to go down, and so some of you are new with us this morning. This will help you so much. Um, Just kind of notice, and for those of you who haven't missed one message, this will also help you to remember. Let's remember the context and the background of where we are in this important study. First of all, the whole picture of Titus is this. The Apostle Paul has left missionary Titus, because that's what he does, that's what Paul was, that's what Titus was. They were missionaries coming in for a task and then leaving. Look what it says, he left missionary Titus on the island of Crete to straighten out what? Messed up churches. If you're new to us this morning, circle the words messed up, because that's what these churches were. If you read the book of Titus, you can find out that they were very, very dysfunctional churches with big problems. And so the churches had some problems. What were they? Those churches had problems. That they had problematic leaders. They had problematic doctrine. And they had problematic behavior. So their, their leaders were messed up. Their doctrine was messed up. And their behavior was not honoring God. It was not honoring to the Lord Jesus. Back in chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, we see that Titus is told to appoint godly elders in the churches. Those are godly pastors in the churches. And notice, you know their godliness by two things. Do you remember what those two things are? The first one is their character, and the second one is their doctrine. Both of those things have to be honoring to God both their character, that's the way that they live, and their doctrine. They can have all the right doctrine, and if they have wrong character, then they simply are not qualified to be a pastor. Look at the next part. In Titus chapter 1, verses 10 through 16, Titus is told to get rid of, and read these out loud with me that's underlined, to get rid of what? The ungodly, fake deceivers that they have for leaders. Satan is always wanting to infiltrate the church all over the world for the last 2,000 years with fake ungodly leaders. If If he can infiltrate the church with the wrong leaders, he can he can misguide the church and cause it to walk away from the gospel. Look at the next part here. We came to chapter two, and the focus shifts from the leaders that we see in chapter one to fill it in to the congregation. And so it's not just about the leaders, but it's also about the congregation. And what we see in this is that there is an inseparable link between believing right and what? Excellent. Living right. You cannot separate. See, you can believe all the right things, but if you don't live it, then it simply is not 
what God has called us to be and what God has called us to do. The Lord Jesus himself said over and over again, you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things that I say. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. You will keep my commandments. And so this is the big picture of what God has called his people to do. Notice with, with, with me in chapter 2 in verse 1, but as, you, but as for you, he's telling Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. So what goes with sound doctrine? What goes with sound doctrine is sound living. You see, what goes with the right beliefs is the right lifestyle. And that's what he's going after in verses 2 through 6. The instruction is to all adults in the church. And then he kind of goes around a circle from the older men to the older women and then to the younger women, and he winds up where we were last week with what? The younger men. So he kind of he goes through with instructions for each one of them and um, in the picture of that. But now what we come to today is that his instructions are to Titus. So it's not just that Paul is giving instructions to the congregation or to the pastors that they're going to a point, the elders that they're going to a point, but Titus also gets put on the grill. And he says, Paul says to Titus, Titus, you better watch yourself. And I'm including you in these instructions and this call. And then we'll see in verse 9 and 10 next week that he deals with the issue of slaves and slavery. We're going to look at that from a biblical perspective next week. And then we all come, the whole chapter comes to the culmination of verses 11 through 14. And here's the beautiful part that we just sang about in God's grace. You see, it is the gospel of God's generous grace through Jesus And this gives the reason and the power to live like this. So all the instructions that he gave to those adults and that he gave to Titus and that he gave to the slaves, the only way that that's possible is that you have the grace of God in your life. And it's all for the glory of Christ. So you're not doing this for your own religiosity. You're not doing this merely for your own welfare. You're doing this ultimately as a life worshiping the one who made us. And so we see this as well. Now, I want to remind you that whenever the Bible gives a lot of instructions to us about our behavior, if we don't see the big picture, and listen to this, if we don't see God's grace in the picture of all of the instructions on how to live, we can become legalistic we can become very, very task and performance oriented. And when we become legalistic, it separates us not only from those that are around us, between us and other people, but it also separates us from God. Because you see, in legalism becomes, what wells up inside of us is a self-righteousness that defeats the power of the gospel in our lives. So what we want to see is if we hold on to the gospel, if we hold on to the truth of God, that all of the motivations for living a righteous life come indeed from the big picture of God's grace, from his power, his spirit within us, and it's all for his glory that the world can see God in us living in the culture but living by a different set of values for his glory. And so this morning, as we often do, I want us to back up and I want us to read the passage. I included the whole chapter one, or excuse me, chapter two on the outline. And so I want you to take that. This is the box in the top of the page. And uh, I want us to see this. Verses seven and eight are what I'm going to teach through this morning very briefly, but I want you to see the whole passage so we really see it. And when we get to verse 11, when we get to verse 11, I want you to see again that this is the section that tells us why we do the previous verses, okay? We cannot do the beginning of chapter 2 without doing the end of chapter 2 in our life. Um, Otherwise, legalism takes over. So let's look at chapter 2 and verse 1. But as for you, that's Titus, as for you, teach what accords with what? Sound Sound doctrine. 
Now, I'm going to circle, ask you to circle a couple of things here as we go. In verse 2, you see the bold words there that say older men. So circle that. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, in steadfastness. Verse 3, circle older women. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women, circle that, to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Verse 6, likewise urge thee, circle it, young men, to be self-controlled. Now, verse 6 is a huge mouthful because it's hard for, for young men to be self-controlled. Um, I know that because I are one myself. And so, um, I, I just want to encourage you that in each of these, we see a beauty of the way God is calling us to live by a set, different set of values that are not detracted. You see, young men are not going to miss out on fun if they have self-control. That's what the world says. Just like young women and women in the life of the church are not going to miss out on being who they need to be and everything else if they live according to God's uh, role that He has given to us. We, and I believe that uh, Mike said this two weeks ago when he was preaching on the women passage, where, where if men will truly love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up and died for her, there are, there are women all over the world, if they have a husband like that, it becomes much, much easier for them to follow him. Now, even if he's not living like that, God's blessing comes when we live according to to his roles and according to his design. Um, I'm telling you, uh, one of the strongest women in the world that I know is my own wife. She is a force to be reckoned with. Um, there is no doubt about that. And uh, we live in relative harmony. Um, so um, <laughs> we have a good time, uh, but we really do. I mean, Marcy and I, for 25 years, all going on 25 years, have just worked together practically every day of our life. We've never had a different job from one another. It's been a beautiful thing that um, as we work together and as we serve together, but, but there is also the issue that, that God has given me a role as a husband, and He's given me a role as a father, and He's given me a role even as a pastor, and God has designed it so that Marcy is able to help complement that, and I am able to help complement all of the gifts that God has given her. And so we, we see this beautiful picture. Look what he says in verse 6. He says, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, verse 7 and 8. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Hmm. And in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may not, excuse me, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Verse 9, slaves, circle that one, slaves are to, be sub, are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing and not argumentative, not pilfering, but following all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now look at verse 11. Here's the reason why we are to do all that. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. This gospel's for everyone. Verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Right out of there to the side, not Crete. Crete didn't live this way. That's not the way the culture of Crete was. And so Paul is saying we're being called to live very different from the doctrines and from the lifestyle that's arousing, around us. Look at verse 13. Waiting for our blessed hope. And what is the blessed hope? The appearing, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for what? good works. Verse 15 says, declare these things, exhort and re rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Verse 15 is a huge exclamation point. That's what that is. He says, 
I mean it about all of these things. This is very important to these churches. This is very important to your witness. This is very important to your joy. This is very important to your worship. And so we come today to Titus being put on the grill. Look with me again at verse 7. I want you to see verse 7. Show yourself, speaking to Titus, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. So at the bottom of the page, fill it in. This is the elder or the leader's, this is Titus, the elder or the leader's example. He is to be a model. He is to be an example. How many times have you heard a parent sarcastically say, um, do what I say, not what I do? Does that work? No. And sometimes there are spiritual leaders who say, do what I say, don't do what I do. And they may not say that outrightly, but they actually are saying that by the way that they live their life. And I want us to look at that for a moment. The first thing I want you to see here is that leaders are considered a part of the congregation. Leaders are considered a part of the congregation. They are not apart from the congregation. It's not like the pastor in the congregation or the pastors in the congregation. No, we need to get this through our head. Pastors are in the body of Christ. Pastors are in the congregation. They are church members too. They are in subjection to the congregation just like anyone else in many ways, a little bit special in other ways. In fact, they have a higher standard of obedience, a higher standard that they are to live by. Um, That's not free license for anyone outside, but we are set to be an example. And Look at the second part. Notice that leaders are an example to this congregation. There it is, right there. And that's what we see in in uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Show yourself, Titus, in all respects to be a model of good works. Now, let me clarify that this is not the idea um, of showing off. In fact, let's look at what this is. This is the idea of showing not showing off. Pastors are to humbly, elders are to humbly be an example to the congregation. They are not to be show-offs in their holiness. They're not to be show-offs in the way that they live. But they are to be showing the congregation what God has called us to do and to be as Christians. You see, We might be tempted to ask the question when he says, make yourself an example, doesn't Jesus condemn, fill that in, doesn't Jesus condemn acts of righteousness in front of others? I mean, if you remember with me, there's several different places where Jesus is saying, if you're like the publican who prays, uh, excuse me, if you're you're like the the religious leader who prays in the doorway um, so that everybody will see how religious he is, And he says, oh God, I thank you that I am not like the sinner, the the Republican, oh my goodness, (laughs) the sinner, (laughs) the sinner, the publican, that means a tax collector, not an official political party. Um, Thank God that I'm not like the publican, the tax collector. And Jesus said, no, the man whose prayer was heard was the sinner that was back in the recesses of the temple pounding on his chest and saying, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. I don't deserve your forgiveness. I don't deserve your grace. And yet God, Jesus is saying, be very careful who you pray before. Be very careful the way that you do this. In fact, look with me in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. It's on the screen that's in front of you. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. In your teaching, show integrity and sound speech, thus not being condemned. I I just want you to see that this is the picture that God has called us to, to live lives that are before him in holiness. Look at the next part. So the issue is motives. We don't want to live with wrong motives in our, in our being a model. If you're going to be a model for things that are right, it's not so that people think highly of you, it's so that people think highly of the gospel, so that people think highly of God. And so look at the next part here. Is Paul being prideful? Fill that in. 
Is Paul being prideful when he, act, when he says, act like me? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, and Philippians chapter 3 are saying, don't turn your page over. Look at this. I want you to notice this. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1 on the screen. It says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul is saying to the people who are, who are listening or people who are reading his letters, he is saying, imitate me because I imitate him. You see, as pastors, we are called to live in such a way that we can look to you, the congregation, and say, it's okay for me to say, live like I do because I'm trying to live like he does and he calls me to. Every spiritual leader, every leader in the life of the church is called to have this responsibility. Look at the screen when it says Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. He's saying what you see us do, you do. Look at Philippians 4.19. We see it again. Whatever you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, do what? Put these things into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And so this is a picture of, of the modeling that God has called us to do. Now, as I was praying and thinking about this, I thought about how beautiful this is throughout the last 2,000 years. God has called Christians to model the life of the Lord Jesus. And I want to I take you into um, just a moment here of Missions 101. I want you to see what many of our folks around the world are seeking to do. I want you to see this. Flip your page over. It's safe to do that. Notice here where it says, here we see the mall process of gospel missions. <clears throat> it begins with the example that we see in Jesus. We see Paul do it. And then we see others throughout history have done this for the last 2,000 years. It's called mall. Can you all say mall? mall? Just like the shopping mall, you can say it like that, the mall. Some of you ladies, now you're really ready to say it. Okay, can you say mall? Mall, M-A-W-L. M -A -W -L. The first one is model. What we are to do is to model the gospel. We are to model what God has called us to do. When we go into a place of the world, when we come into planting a new church, part of the picture that a missionary does, part of the picture that a Titus or a Paul does, and some that are being called out of this church are called to do, is to go and to model the gospel. That's telling the gospel, preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, but really it's showing the gospel along with that. So we model it. We see this in the life of Jesus in Matthew chapter 9. Jesus models ministry and expects the disciples to do the thing. The same thing in chapter 10, he sends them out to do it. In 1 Corinthians 11, you see this on your outline, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. We just looked at that. And so this first section here is model. But then the second thing that comes along, it's not just modeling, it's assist. You allow others to assist in this. And so as you're modeling it, you begin to let them participate in this. This is, a, this is the way that we see a, a very common trend all through the Scripture. We see God including his people. Jesus allows the disciples to assist in feeding the 5,000. Jesus actually told them to do some things. I mean, they came to him with five loaves and two, two fish. They had their own means. Jesus had his own means, and Jesus said, we can make much of this. He prayed over this. Of course, the, the, uh, the, fish, the five loaves and two fish were multiplied. 5,000 plus people are served. And what are the disciples doing? The disciples are involved with passing it out. The disciples are involved with recollecting it. The disciples are participating in the ministry of Jesus. And then look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul uses Timothy. So Timothy at first is walking with him, seeing him, watching the model. But then Paul starts to use Timothy. And we see it here that Timothy is sent back up to Thessalonica with a letter. And he delivers the letter. And he's told to stay there. And he's told to work in this. And so we see that Timothy is now assisting. And then what happens? The one who is teaching comes to the W. He watches. He watches what is happening, and he observes, are they getting it? 
He observes where they are. He allows them to continue the ministry as they become more and more involved. Jesus delegates baptism to his disciples. Jesus was not doing the baptisms. In fact, it was the disciples that were doing it. Look at the next part. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul watches Timothy. He tells him to entrust what he has seen and given it to others. And so Paul is watching him and saying, okay, Timothy, you go do what I, was, what I gave you. What I gave to you, you pass along to others. Now just think about Tony and Kaylin. Just think about other folks around the world. This is what they're doing. They're modeling, they're assisting, and they're watching. Now that part of that watching is very active. You're, you're continuing to help them get it right. But then the next one is not very intuitive. Eventually it comes time to leave. And notice this with me. Model, assist, watch, and leave. This is exactly what Jesus does. In Acts chapter 1, the ministry is, is complete in this. Jesus commissions his disciples and ascends to where? To the Father. You say, well, why didn't Jesus stay? Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been so much better if Jesus had stayed and continued to do that? He only taught for three years, and then he died on the cross. He rose from the dead. And think about what more he could have done if he had stayed. No, Jesus said, it is better that I go. It is better that I go because I'm going to send one that when he comes, you're going to see why I have gone back to the glory of the Father. And so here we see that Jesus leaves. Model, assist, watch, and what's the last one? Leave. Model, assist, watch, and leave. Look at Acts chapter 20. Paul tells the Ephesian elders, after years of ministry with them, loving them, caring for them. He stops back through, and in a tearful all-night meeting, he says to the elders that night, he says, gentlemen, I'm never going to see you again. I am, I am leaving you, and you have the gospel. You continue in the gospel. And indeed, that is what we see happening. Now, think about it with me. We have a, an enormous population upon the earth, and there are some Christians that are great commission Christians that are ready to do this. If we simply go and stay in every place, we will never win the world to Christ. But if we simply keep going and keep going and keep going and do what we see the Apostle Paul doing with Titus, telling Titus to the Cretan churches, you get the right leaders, you stay in the gospel, you live the right way. And then Titus is going to be there, left there for a little while, and then he's going to leave the island of Crete. This is why Titus' message, both in the way he lives and in what he says, must be spot on. And so, friends, this is where the church must be. This is where we must stay. He says in verse 7, he says, be a model of good works. Now, in our church, we make a very, very, very big emphasis of the fact that we are not saved by works. And the reason that we make a very big, if you're new to Sheridan Hills, if you're new to really Protestant Baptist life, you will often hear this distinction over and over and over again, and it's because the common deception of the world and the common deception of Satan is that you, by your own works, can be good enough for God. Eventually, your good can outweigh your bad, and God will accept you. Now, this is the way the world thinks. This is the way humans think. We think about this about a lot of things. And so, what we come to, when we come to see the gospel, that God flips that on its head. God says that in spite of who you are, not because of who you are, in spite of who you are, you can be saved if you come through me. I have come to give you a different kind of salvation that is true and that can truly set you free from your sins. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Uh, excuse me, 8 and 9 is what we usually quote, but we include verse 10 here because it's so powerful and it deals with this very issue of good works. Look at chapter, chapter 2, verse 8 of Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Can you circle the word grace? This is the biggest word that we can find in the, the beautiful picture of God's salvation. It's undeserved favor. It's unmerited favor upon us. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And then look what it says. And this not of your own doing, not your works, it's the gift of God. Verse 9 says it very clearly, underline it, 
not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The picture is, your good works will not save you. But here's the beautiful fulfillment of the whole thing. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, his workmanship, he does the work, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's why we were created, was to do the right thing, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, this is the picture, and this is not on your outline, but I want you to see the screen that's in front of you and what it says. Um, We don't do good works because we want to be saved. That's, That's not the way it works. You see, true Christians, we do good works because we what? Are saved. I'm going to ask you to read that slide out loud with me. We don't. Are you ready? Read it. We don't do good works because we want to be saved. True Christians do good works because we are saved. This is the picture that God has saved us. Verse 10 of Ephesians 2 says that God has saved us to glorify Him in the way that we live to glorify Him in our thoughts, to glorify Him in our actions, in our morality, in our creativity, in all that God has given us, in our sacrifice, in our generosity. God has called us to do good works, not because we desire to be saved, but because He has saved us. Now, in our study of the five solas, we've often talked about this. Here's a key quote for those of you who have never seen this before. This is very, very important. Faith alone saves. Faith alone saves. But faith that saves is what? Is never alone. Faith alone will save you from your sin, but you see, if you're truly saved, your faith will never be alone. What will it be accompanied with? That's exactly right, good works. So let's read that out loud together. This is one that's worth you memorizing if you've never memorized it. It's a good point on theology for you. Faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. Okay, that was about half of you. Let's all say it out loud. Are you ready? You've heard it. Faith alone saves, but faith that saves is never alone. This is the point that Paul is making to Titus for his example. He's saying, Titus, make sure those churches see your life and they see your good works and they see that your faith is in action. This is a powerful force for them in their discipleship, but it's also, it's the power of the gospel that is gonna win Cretans to Christ when they see Christians living in the same culture, in the same society, but with different values and living in a different way, a way that's noble, and that's what verse 11 and following covers. So notice this with me, that this is the call for Christians to be true Christians. And Titus, it begins with their leaders. Um, And so it's not only this picture of, of the example in this art, in this regard, but I want you to also notice the keep in mind. Keep in mind this. A person's teaching will have no more validity than their own example. Think about that. A person's teaching will have no more validity and it will have no more impact than their own example. You see, you can say all the right things, but then if you do not do the things that you say, people will look at that and go, yeah, right. Now this especially, I mean, you could put out there to the side, parenting. I mean, this is a huge issue for parents. You can say you love God, but if your kids never see you crack open the Bible, and they never see you, you can say that God is the most important thing in the universe. You can say that God and and the gospel is, is critical to our lives and it's critical to our eternity, but if they don't see Jesus in you, why would they believe that God is the most important critical thing? You see, one of the most powerful things a parent can do is let a child watch his father or mother walk with God. I can say to you, I, I don't have, 
I mean, there are a lot of things that Clell and D. Coleman said to me. Um, there are a lot of things that they taught me. There's things that I could, I could just spout on and on and on about the wisdom that God would give or dad would give. But I can tell you that one of the most powerful things that I have a, I have a memory in my mind of saying, wow, dad is a real Christian. And it was because I'd go running through the house looking for a bobby pin or looking for something for some project I was doing. And I'd go through the bedroom door in the afternoon and there is dad on the floor praying. And it, he didn't let me disturb him. He ignored me. Because God was, you know, I'm stepping over him as I'm trying to get to the thing on his desk, and then I'm stepping back, you know, just a typical obnoxious 10-year-old. And, but, but dad was modeling. Dad was providing an exam, and he, the door was closed. It's not like he was saying, okay, son, I'm going to go spend time with God now. I mean, that, that's not what happened. Dad just was humbly living out his life. And so moms and dads, as we model the things that are right, as we model Christian disciplines, as we model spending time in prayer and spending time in God's word, as we model spending time loving others, serving others, listen, you're doing it right now. You're doing the right thing right now. You're modeling being in worship with God's people in the heart of the church. This is the picture that our children need to see. We are Christians. We are following Jesus. This is what Christians do. And so this issue of modeling is so important, and our example validates what we teach. Look at the next one that is here. It's not only what we see in verse 7, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, but look there either at the top of the page or in the, on the screen. And in your teaching, show three things. Dig integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. I want you to see these very quickly. Letter A, the issue of integrity. You see, his teaching, his teaching must show integrity or fill it in purity. The idea here is that it's literally indestructible. You see, when we when we have the truth of God, the truth of God can never be degraded and taken away if it's, if it's truly presented in this picture of the purity of God's truth. There's no, it's indestructible. It lasts forever. The grass withers, the flower fades. Those are destructible, but the word of our God stands forever. And so here we see that the integrity of the message is what Titus must hold on to. He must hold on to the gospel. And he must hold on to all of the teachings of Jesus. You see, fill these in. It cannot be laced with other things. And that's very often what will happen is that a false teacher will come along and he'll have the gospel, but then he'll lace it with other things. He'll add other things to it that don't belong there. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul says this, and it's on the screen in front of you. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or wisdom. He's not adding, he's not lacing, he's not getting self-attention uh, here. As I proclaim to you the testimony about God. Read verse 2 out loud with me. For I decided to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Isn't that beautiful? It all boils down to Jesus, him crucified for our sins. Now, the point is he's not leaving out the resurrection. And what about the resurrection? That, that's not the point. The point is he wasn't adding like other teachers were adding. He wasn't adding things from the law. He wasn't adding spiritualism from Greek culture. He wasn't adding anything else to the gospel. He was simply saying, here is the gospel of God. It's found in Jesus Christ. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ. He died on the, sin, on the cross for your sins, and trust and belief in him alone is what will save you from your sins. So the, we, we need to be very careful that as we have teachers in the church, as we look to who should be a teacher in the church, 
that he does not lace the gospel. She, as for women's Bible studies and women's ministries and women's other all kinds of things in the community, that she does not alter the gospel, he does not alter the gospel, lacing it with other things. Look at the next part here. It cannot be lacking the whole truth. Now, I've been very convicted about this in recent years. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, I've read that a thousand times in my life. It's the Great Commission passage. It's on the screen in front of you. Look what it says in verse 19. Jesus is about to send to the Father. He's leaving when he makes this statement. So look what he says. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now that is a massive statement. Jesus taught us much. Jesus taught us much about the glory of God, the person of God, who God is, what his, what his desire is, what his motivations are, what sin is, what sin is, is not. And Jesus was calling us to come and to teach again all that he has taught to us. And so, a church needs to be very careful to include the whole truth. I want to say to you that there are some churches that are very passionate about just evangelism. And they teach Christ and Him crucified, but to the exclusion of the other things that are in Scripture. And that can produce very passionate Christians without a firm foundation. And so I don't know what maybe context you grew up in, but I want to say to you one of the reasons that we take week after week after week, and in some cases years to study a, a book of the Bible, is because we want to get a sense and get a, a filling of all that God has for us in this and begin to learn to study the Bible in all of its beauty, in all of its depth. So we are not lacking the whole truth. So it cannot be laced with other things. It cannot be lacking the whole truth. And if it's going to have integrity and purity, it cannot be leaning toward a, another meaning. You see, and put out there to the side, twisting scripture. It cannot be leaning toward another meaning. Sorry for the L's in all of this, but that's just kind of how it came out. Um, I want you to notice here that in our culture today, there are many people who will take a passage of scripture or a group of scriptures and, and take it in what we call proof text or, or twist it and use it out of context in order to say something else that is completely contrary to the rest of the Word of God. And this is a problem not only in America, but this is a problem all around the world. All around the world on spiritualism, on prosperity theology, on various other um, heresies and uh, divergencies that come into the, the Christian theology, it's because people are taking a bit of truth and then twisting it. And that is an exceedingly dangerous thing to do for the life of the church. Notice here that we should not ever compromise the integrity or the purity of the gospel. We need to take the whole thing very carefully. Letter B, fill this in and notice here with me. He is teaching, his teaching must show dignity. And the word dignity there is actually another word for seriousness. So this is, this is not a joking matter. This is, this is not a light and easy, no big deal thing that's just kind of an add-on to your life. Um, I'm afraid that many churches have kind of turned toward that. They've not looked deeply. I mean, and it can be from a high, um, a high ecumenical, high liturgical church um, that has lost the gospel, or it can be a very, very low earthy, um, kind of loud and proud church that has lost the gospel, um, that there's not a seriousness toward the gospel in this. Maybe it's a seriousness toward um, higher thought and higher learning and a seriousness toward um, altruistic values, but it maybe is not a seriousness toward the true gospel and humility of Jesus. Or maybe it's just this, this very low, loud vibrato that is not truly taking seriously the whole claims of Christ. We must be aware of this. Now, notice that this does not rule out humor. Um, I, I don't believe that humor is, you know, that God calls us to be um, so straight and so 
um, serious about the gospel, that there's no joy in our life whatsoever. I, I do not believe that whatsoever. But what it should rule out is shallow instruction. It should rule out shallow instruction. I think the people of God need to be joyful, and I think that we need to be able to laugh. But we also need to be deep. We need to be carefully, thoughtfully deep in what God has said. The stakes of eternity are high. Heaven and hell is in the balance. And we have a gospel that deals with that. We should give attention to it as if it is that serious. Notice the next part here. Why trade the eternal for the mundane? And I think that that's what happens when either a high church or a low church trades the eternal truths of the gospel for the things of this life. The things of this life are mundane. They're not going anywhere. It's all going to stay right here. But the things of God have eternity and heaven as its goal. Notice here, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, and it's on the screen. This is so powerful. Please pay careful attention to this. Paul is writing to Timothy, another young missionary. And he says to him in verse 1, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is, the ju- who is to judge the living and the dead. Do you see the seriousness right there? He's going to judge the living and the dead. You see, this is not a mundane thing. This is not a, a shallow thing. And by his appearing and his kingdom, and here's what he's told him, telling him to do in verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own what? Passion. So these little things that they're just kind of into. Verse 4. And will turn away from listening to the truth. And look what it says. And wander off into what? myths. Verse 5, as for you, Timothy, always be sober-minded. You see, this is serious. Endure in suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. This is what God has given us to do. And we cannot do this if everything is a joke. We cannot do this if we do not see heaven and hell in the balance. This letter C that I want you to see here is also found in verse 8. And it says, and sound speech cannot be condemned. So here's the third area. It must show, his teaching must show sound speech. And what this really means is, there's, the, there's another way to look at it here, another word that would help us understand the meaning, is wholesome. It's sound speech. It's, it's whole speech. It's not, it's not lacking anything, and both the the message and the sense by which the message is delivered are together. It's whole, and it's wholesome. So if it's a serious message, it comes off as serious. If it's a loving message, it has warmth. If it's a harsh message of the realities of certain aspects of the gospel, then it has a gravitas that is there. In fact, that's another word that was used for this, a gravitas. So notice this with me, and this is a real issue for for us as we close, because we see this stuff going on all around us, both here in South Florida and really all around the world. The first one is, there's sometimes, it, it must not be shock or corrosive preaching. Sometimes it's, it's not sound speech that people give because it's shock preaching or it's corrosive preaching. Uh, here's an example of this. A few years ago, a lot of evangelical leaders had to write articles and make statements and so forth um, against preachers cussing in the pulpit. Some of you may remember that. It was probably five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago. There were t- a couple of firebrand preachers, and in order to be cool amidst all of their coolness with the culture, every now and then they would be preaching along and let one fly during their sermon. 
And everybody kind of, and he would say, no, I meant to say that. And the reason I meant to say that, and, and you know, they would, they would, and it got to be kind of a common thing. So more guys started doing it, and it was kind of edgy, and it was kind of cool. Our pastor preached, you know, cusses. There was even uh, blogs that kind of talked about cussing preachers. Until there came a point where some of the main leaders said, what in the world are you guys doing? Don't sully the gospel. Don't bring the gospel down in the mud in this. Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth. And so here's the picture. I mean, my goodness, the teaching is not to be shocking and corrosive in this way. How about this? Have you ever heard of Westboro Baptist Church in Kansas? Here was a firebrand, independent Baptist, not a Southern Baptist, an independent Baptist guy, and his big thing was everywhere they went all over the nation with huge posters, they were ardently against homosexuality, and they, in, in the, the glory of their fervor, they would preach very harshly against homosexuality. In fact, their website was God Hates Fags. That was their website. Now, if, do, do you see what Paul is telling Titus not to do? I mean, look at the box at the top of the page. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and then show, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that what? cannot be condemned. Is the world going to condemn a God hates fags message? Of course, and it should. That is not at all a Christian spirit. Just because you disagree with homosexuality and just because you teach what the Bible says about our sexuality and about marriage, it does not mean that you are to be prophetically harsh seeking to condemn and drive people away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ simply unnecessary. Look at the next part. There are, are the, the idea of entertainment preaching. This is, again, one of those things that seeks to bring the world into the pulpit. This week, I spoke with a lady that moved from one city to another city, from another state to another city, and she said, yes, when I arrived, I started looking around churches that I want to go to, and I found this church online, it looked really cool, and so I went, and I couldn't believe it. The first Sunday, you know, I just kind of learned that the pastor wears a different football jersey every single Sunday, and what sold, literal, literal words, what sold me on the church was that they have Krispy Kreme donuts and Starbucks coffee every Sunday. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Those were the very words spoken to me this week. People choosing a church based upon a brand of donut. I love Krispy Kremes. I don't think anybody else makes donuts like Krispy Kreme. I love Krispy Kreme. But let me tell you, friends, the gospel is so much more important than Krispy Kreme donuts. And if the reason that a church, if, if that's their draw to the world, I'm sorry, but that's bait and switch. God has called us to be unashamedly, beautifully in love with the gospel and that we would hold on to the gospel and not make all the issues of the culture or our appetite the appeal to the world. The next one that I would just say here is spectacle preaching. Spectacle preaching is that when the method of delivery becomes more important than the message. When the method of delivery becomes, or the mode of the delivery becomes more powerful than the message that is there. And I, you know, I grew up here in the South, and occasionally on long, I went on a 9,000 mile road trip with my grandparents when I was 10 years old, and we went in every imaginable church you can imagine, in 32 states of the Union. Every Sunday we were in church. And I remember as a 10 year old seeing a lot of different kind of preaching over a two month period. And I remember, I, I, all I can explain was being absolutely terrified and frightened by some of the preaching that was there. And it wasn't because of the content. It was because of the delivery. And it, it, this is what my brother, brother one time called clearing a spot and pitching a fit. I mean, you just clear out a spot here and you pitch a fit as you're preaching. And everybody goes, man, he's a good preacher. <laughs> 
And, you know, everybody thinks, oh, that was powerful. Did you see his veins popping out of his head? He was sweating. It was loud and everything else. And he, he you know, he even had the huh, huh in, in the midst of his head. You know, you're sitting there looking at this, and the spectacle becomes the delivery, not the content. We must be very careful because, you see, each one of these, the shock corrosive thing, the entertainment thing, or the spectacle preaching, People on the outside, that's all they see. They don't hear the powerful message of the gospel clearly rising above everything else. So what we would desire, that when people come in, and maybe it's you this morning, maybe you've come, maybe you've never heard the gospel presented in such a way where you're hearing over and over again that God, creator of the universe, died on a cross was laid in a tomb and rose again to pay for your sins. This is the beautiful gospel. This is the gospel that if you will believe upon him, if you will turn to him and believe, and turn away from your sins and trust in him, that you can know him personally, that he has promised to forgive your sins if you will turn to him and call upon him. The Bible says in John chapter 1 and verse 12, but as many as received him, who believed in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. What a beautiful, beautiful truth that God calls us to. Now I want you to see the last two points that are here as we close. You see, if someone is going to reject Christ, here, here's the idea. We must live and teach. We must live and teach in such a way that if someone is going to re reject Christ, that it, it is the message that they have a problem with, not the messenger. And there's the most important part there at the end. Look what it says. We want to make sure that they have a problem with the message, not the messenger. You see, it's not up to us whether or not men and women accept the gospel. But it is up to us to seek to present it in such a way that does not distract from that message, that does not bleed away the power of that message, that does not candy coat that message, that doesn't change that message. And we, we want to make sure that we don't needlessly push them away by the way that we give that message, whether it would be at home in your neighborhood or whether it would be at work or whether it would be here at church. Christians are called to make sure that the message is clear. The last thing I want us to say as we close and near about is this. May our good news of Jesus be clear to others by our words and deeds. You see, it's both. That the good news of Jesus, that our message, you say, well, shouldn't that be the message of Jesus Christ? Well, no, it's, it becomes yours. And our hope and our prayer is that our message would make very clear by words and deeds the sake of the gospel. Would you bow for prayer with me?